Hey, it's Kay. And this is Skittles, Treasury Secretary. Neoliberalism. The ideological belief in the free market, in deregulation and reduced government interference. Or at least, that's how it's typically discussed. Today, we're going to explore an often overlooked aspect of neoliberalism that even many of its critics miss. To do that, we have to go back to what is commonly considered the beginning of the neoliberal turn. Long before Clinton's market-based solutions to education and housing, even a few years before Reagan started arming Contras, in a putrid, grey island nation that is known to historians only as the United Kingdom. In the 1980s, this wretched place was ruled by a great evil. Even today, its name is whispered in hushed tones, lest her specter be summoned. They say on a cool, quiet night, if you put your ear to the ground, you can still hear her burning in hell. World War II, and you may have heard this, was a pretty bad time. In an effort to avoid a repeat of the severe depression and social unrest that followed the First World War, the British coalition government, headed by Churchill and Attlee, promised the development of a strong set of publicly owned services following World War II. This would be delivered by the following Labour government and included the NHS and a robust welfare system. This led to a sort of Keynesian mixed economy that is often referred to as the post-war consensus. This saw labor and even conservative governments tolerating trade unions at a level they had not before and never would again. In return, the labor unions would play ball and not do anything too revolutionary. This strong labor movement combined with the aforementioned public investment led to rapid increase in living conditions for many as poverty rates plummeted from 18% before the war to an estimate between 4 and 9% by the 50s. Basically, this was the last time things were looking up for anyone except landlords on the British Isles. Thatcher's election in 1979 was in part a response to a series of economic crises that had defined the 70s, including a global stock market crash, a banking crisis, and an oil crisis. Her response to this economic instability was a simple one. The free market would get us out of this jam, but to free the market, we have to destroy the post-war consensus and suppress labor unions who are restricting the market with pesky inefficiencies like workers' rights. During Thatcher's reign, she would transition both the economic model of the UK, but also the ideological norms of the country towards neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is free market ideology. It holds that if we deregulate the market, it can and will solve our economic problems and lead to greater prosperity for all. John the Duncan, who makes a lot of great videos about neoliberalism, cites award-winning American economist Joseph Stiglitz, describing neoliberalism as That grab bag of ideas based on the fundamentalist notion that markets are self-correcting, allocate resources efficiently, and serve the public interest well. It was this market fundamentalism that underlay Thatcherism, Reaganomics, and the so-called Washington Consensus in favour of privatisation, liberalisation, and independent central banks focusing single-mindedly on inflation. John goes on to rightly point out a problem with the way Stiglitz characterizes neoliberalism. He is certainly criticizing neoliberalism in this article, which opens by saying, history has not been kind to neoliberalism. But he does so in a way that makes a crucial mistake. And it's a mistake that is echoed by the helpful What is Neoliberalism explainers put out by the BBC and Harvard University that come up first if you search neoliberalism on YouTube. Both Stiglitz, the highly regarded academic, and these serious, well-resourced institutions are assuming that the rhetoric of neoliberalism necessarily lines up with the economic policy of neoliberalism, which wouldn't be a problem unless 
politicians weren't always completely honest with us. You really think someone would do that? Just go on the Parliament and tell lies? Neoliberalism is best understood in two halves, ideology and economics. The small state, free market fetishizing narrative about neoliberalism that we see from Stiglitz and most mainstream discussions of neoliberalism is often treated as if it is its economic policy, when in fact it is its ideological policy. The idea that the market possesses an almost mystical capacity for self-correction and management if only the darn state would stay out of its way is an ideological statement. And ideology isn't for your leaders, it's for you. So why do I describe what many consider to be the heart of neoliberalism as ideological but not economic? Because neoliberal governments like Thatcher's do not actually shrink the state or follow a policy of non-interference in the market. Like the neoliberals who would follow her, Thatcher loved the state. In fact, Thatcher significantly expanded the police and security aspects of the state throughout her time in power. This was necessary in part to combat organized labor, from which she was attempting to strip crucial rights and protections. In addition, Thatcher's government maintained what Richard Woodward calls a dual industrial policy. This is the practice of rhetorically opposing state intervention in the market, while in reality intervening quite extensively. Thatcher's government actually subsidized key industries, including the automotive industry, which also featured a bailout of British Leyland to the tune of just under a billion pounds, which, adjusted for inflation, is worth <laughs> in 2022. The agriculture industry also received enormous subsidies, and in 1981, Thatcher defended the heavy subsidization of British farms after promising that the state would stop interfering in the market by stating that our farmers are being asked to compete not on equal terms, but against heavily subsidized competitors. We like equality now, Maggie. This is a very revealing statement. It is an admission that the fundamental argument that industry is at its best when unregulated and free of the state is incorrect. If left to their own devices, British agriculture companies would not have been able to compete with those of other countries operating on a more Keynesian model, where many are partially or entirely nationalized and subsidized with public money. That economic model simply competes more effectively. Keep that idea in mind for a little later. So, how did she get away with this? Taking every opportunity to extol the virtues of state non-interference in industry and using that firmly held belief to attack regulations on businesses and workers' rights, and then turning around and massively subsidizing private industry. That kind of hypocrisy should have been political self-destruction, surely. Well, she deployed a very clever trick that is known in the field of political science as lying. You really think someone would do that? Woodward's research into the spending of Thatcher's government found that while on paper industrial subsidy reduced during Thatcher's leadership, enormous sums of government spending were simply being categorized as something else. For example, billions of pounds of agricultural subsidy were instead classified as departmental research, advisory services, and administration. I'm completely serious. It's as simple as that. They just classified their subsidies as something else in the treasury and said, look, we're spending less on subsidies. British journalists on social media are always announcing how important they are for holding power accountable and keeping the public informed. So it may surprise you to learn that this scandalous practice of misrepresenting state spending to give the appearance of a commitment to unimpeded free market policy went largely uninvestigated by the media at the time. There was and has continued to be a tendency to focus exclusively on official statements and not you know, what Thatcher's government actually did. Woodward described this as leading to a state-orchestrated masquerade, in which the very people who should have been criticizing the inconsistencies between Thatcher's ideological rhetoric and actual economic policy were instead complicit in it. Perhaps the extremely wealthy owners of our papers and news networks who were no doubt ecstatic that the tide was turning against labor unions had something to do with that. Remember, ideology isn't for them, it's for you. 
Thatcher is famously quoted as saying, economics are the method, the object is to change the heart and soul. Her neoliberal project was not just about selling off publicly owned industries while pumping money into the pockets of private industrialists, although that was one of her signature moves. British gas shares, they come out in November. If you see Sid, tell him. Her project was about reorienting the way the people view themselves and their relationship to the state. The post-war consensus imbued the public with the idea that the state owes them. Regular working-class people fought in two world wars, rebuilt the country after both of them, and did all of the work that actually keeps the country running. It was justified for them to expect that the state in turn would look after them. This was the idea that Thatcher aimed to dismantle. By cultivating a sense that people are not members of a society in which they owe each other something, but sovereign entrepreneurial individuals whose value is dictated by their personal financial achievements. The perception of state assistance and publicly owned services began to change. During the post-war period, welfare was seen by many workers as a victory. Their struggles in the labor movement led to a system where, if a worker lost their job, was injured, or became ill and unable to work for long periods, the country that their labor had been propping up would have to look after them. They put in, and they could take out when they needed it. But if people are not members of society, but individuals responsible for their own economic security, welfare becomes something shameful. A worker claiming welfare is no longer enjoying their hard-earned right as a worker. They are experiencing failure as an individual who has been unable to support themselves without state assistance. This led to a stigma around benefits, which, of course, has continued to the modern day. And this stigma spread throughout the public services. The state providing something for you became an embarrassment, a shameful thing. Unless, of course, you're a wealthy industrialist accepting millions in government grants. But by concealing the subsidization of private industry and demonizing public services used by the working class, Thatcher eroded solidarity among the working class and transformed many working people from class-conscious subjects who understood their position in society into temporarily embarrassed middle-class homeowners. With programs like Right to Buy, she touted homeownership as the ultimate expression of both success and security. Climbing the ladder to become middle class became the new avenue for a worker to improve their conditions, rather than unionizing and struggling for better pay and conditions with other workers. And she was quite successful at increasing the number of homeowners who would now have a personal economic incentive to support certain conservative policies which she achieved, again, via government subsidy. She once again interfered in the free market to expand the homeowning population, a crucial step in ideologically shifting the British public towards neoliberal ideals. On the eve of the Thatcherite crusade, half of all workers were trade unionists. By 1995, the number had fallen to a third. The old industries associated with working-class identity were being destroyed. There no longer seemed anything to celebrate about being working class. But Thatcherism promised an alternative. Leave the working class behind, it said, and come join the property-owning middle classes instead. Those who failed to do so would have no place in the new Britain. Another way Thatcher's project was damaging ideologically is it instilled the idea in the public that capitalism and the state are diametrically opposed that they are antithetical to each other, and as one grows, the other must therefore shrink. In fact, it is a direct byproduct of Thatcherism and the neoliberal turn that so many people who themselves have a fairly sophisticated understanding of capitalism and its problems still view anything other than full-blown libertarian free market economics as somehow hostile to capitalism as a system. Think socialism is when the government does stuff. When the reality is that capitalism needs the state for a great deal of important functions. The state is able to centralize military power and control a monopoly on direct force. Through that force, it is able to protect property rights, which is extremely important if your wealth comes from owning property, rather than selling your labor. 
It also serves to discipline labor by breaking strikes, criminalizing undesirable behavior, and protecting you, the boss or landlord, from physical retaliation for your economic violence against your workers and tenants. And that's to say nothing of the capacity of the state to subjugate other economies for the enrichment of capitalists at home. We're going to free your economy, even if we have to murder and enslave you to do it. By obfuscating these aspects of the state's function, assisted by a deeply incurious media, by concealing the theft of billions of public funds which were funneled into the private sector, by insisting that they are shrinking the state while expanding its authority, the neoliberal politician is able to create an ideological environment where people can oppose the state, oppose all social programs, and associate those positions with greater social and economic freedom, all while supporting the armed aspects of the state which actually enforce a certain social and economic status quo, which reduce both personal and collective freedom, all while never feeling for a second that your views are contradictory. And that is the heart of a lot of modern conservative politics in the UK, the US, and beyond. In Tom Crompton's fantastic essay, Thatcher's Spiral, he lays out the way that Thatcher's political opponents not only sabotaged themselves, but contributed to her ideological process by making the mistake of accepting the premise of her politics. He describes how her opposition adopted her vocabulary, discussing things like labor market flexibility and optimizing labor market performance. Even if they're using these terms to suggest that Thatcher is underperforming in regards to these categories, it accepts the premise of the categories themselves, which is that workers are a commodity in the marketplace. He describes her opposition attacking her government for creating low consumer confidence, which accepts the premise that the reason we work is to consume. In fact, I did precisely this earlier in this video when I noted that Thatcher had to subsidize British farms because they couldn't outcompete other countries' agriculture industries. It's a point that highlights her hypocrisy and total ideological dishonesty but it also kind of tacitly accepts the idea that the primary goal of the industry that grows our food ought to be competing in the market. The reason we shouldn't want our farms to be run by private interests is not because they compete more effectively when nationally run or funded, but because the production of our food should not be directed by the interests of a few incredibly rich landowners, who themselves will never want for food because our need to eat often contradicts the needs of the market, as seen in the metric tons of food destroyed every year because overproduction would drive prices down and crash the industry, while people are literally starving. Just as Thatcher's political opponents defeated themselves by accepting her ideological premises uncritically, if we wish to criticize and understand neoliberalism today, we cannot make the mistake of taking it at face value. Arguing against an ethos of privatization and small government is not a problem in and of itself, but doing so risks accepting the premise that this is the primary objective of neoliberal politics. While Thatcher and the many neoliberal governments around the world that followed her absolutely carried out privatization and deregulation, they aggressively used the state. The state is a tool, and it can be used to direct public money. That's taxpayer money and the income from publicly owned services into the hands of their friends. Neoliberalism is a project of theft. Theft of the services and money that we own, that we ought to control. And theft of our sense of self, our ability to see ourselves as human actors and not market commodities. And certainly the theft of resources from countries who cannot defend themselves from major powers. Neoliberal governments do not promote free trade, they promote their control over trade, especially through imperialism. They do not promote free association between workers and bosses, they promote greater control of bosses over workers. And they do not promote smaller government, they expand the aspects of government that exert control on you and me. When you strip away all the rhetoric about the free market and the cute pseudo-economics, that's the only thing you find in the black heart of neoliberalism.
a ravenous need for control. No matter how many people have to die or how many governments we have to coup. So why on earth should our main arguments about neoliberalism be about the free market? What free market? So all the kids are bastards Who don't blame them Yeah, they learn by example Blame the folks who sold the future for the highest bid That's right That's your fault, the kids <laughs>